So, okay, um, so like you see on the agenda there, my name is Tony Rucci, and um, I'm the director of uh, data center for Re uh, the Reno Data Center for NJVC down in uh, Reno. And um, I also run critical infrastructure protection. So, this is a little bit out of my realm of what I do this day and age, but in my previous life, um, before I retired, I was a counterintelligence uh, agent for uh, about 21 years and uh, spent a little bit of time up there in the White House. So, that's a little bit what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, it, was, it was kind of timely with this conference, and that's part of why I submitted this talk in, in addition to another. But, uh, um, you know, 9-11 is something that is going to you know, re remain with all of us uh, throughout our adult lives, and, and we're going to pass that on. To, but a lot of the, the uh, younger generation now, it, it's already passing them by. They don't even know what 9-11 was except for what they see in the news and, uh, and uh, everybody else's speculation. So uh, I do want to give you a little bit of a warning that this is all my perspective. Uh, these are the, the events as I saw them and as I was engaged that day. Um, I was with the First Lady. And um, so if you ask 10 people in a room, uh, you know, what, who was involved in, from the staff that day, and if you talk to each one of them, you're going to get nine or possibly even 10 different perspectives on any given event. Um, so does everybody remember what they were doing when they got word of, of the uh, attacks that day? It's going to kind of live in our generation as kind of the Kennedy uh, and Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, attacks. You know, everybody remembers that moment in life. So with that said, so here's, here's a little bit about uh, my background and, and the time that I served and, uh, and, and suffered. And I hope you guys don't mind if I roam a little bit because that's just what I do. But um, I was there at the White House from uh, 1998 to, to 2004, kind of came in at the very tail end of the Monica Lewinsky investigation under the Clinton administration and uh, left about halfway through Bush 43 administration. It's a two-year assignment and do the math, right? So it's a two-year assignment, but if you, you kind of gravitate to that role or something like that, they, they, they keep you around. And I was active duty military. I was a warrant officer uh, agent. And um, there are a lot of folks there who spend their entire careers in the military assigned to the White House. There are 2,300 military members who are assigned to the White House Military Office. It's an umbrella organization that supports 15 different organizations under the White House. You're familiar with some of them, some of the more popular ones. Uh, Marine One, Air Force One, uh, the White House Mess, the guys who are the chefs and the valets, um, ironing the president's underwear and socks and things like that. And uh, <laughs> um, it's actually a hard job to recruit those guys uh, because their perception in the, in the Navy ranks, and, mo and all of them are Navy, in the Navy ranks, their perception is, is that uh, they have to clean the toilets for the White House. And that's somebody else's job. That's a subcontractor. But um, so I worked in the White House Security Office. I was a counterintelligence operations officer, and I also worked technical policy oversight. Uh, I, was a, I tracked early in my career as a computer crimes investigator. And so as soon as you have any kind of a te uh, technical or a zeros and ones flavor in your background, they, they threw you in the technical policy. And back then, uh, when, I, when I came in there uh, in 98, that's about the time that we're all migrating to these little things we call personal electronic devices. And, uh, you know, it was all the, uh, uh, it, it wasn't even an iPhone and, and it wasn't a lot of cell phones and Blackberries and things like that. It was uh, the PEDs and it was the little um, iPacks and, and things like that and the Palm Pilot. And everything was associated, everything was called a Palm Pilot. If you had anything that was a handheld device, it was a Palm Pilot. So helping write some of that policy, and it was kind of comical uh, throughout the community because people were scared to death of them. Now you, they're, they're all going, hey, can I bring this inside your secure facility? But I spent a lot of time on uh, trips working advance and uh, working the threat package. Um, and I, I travel all over the world, 71 trips, as you can see, to 94 countries. So you learn how to say hello, goodbye, and thank you in a lot of different languages. And that's kind of the, the, the door to open uh, to get any kind of uh, business done. I'll, I'll share that a little bit. So that was one of the privileges. You got to travel a lot of places that you'd probably never travel in your life. Um, uh, so that was probably one of our, our neat little privileges that we got to share, of course, the Wall of China, then out in Panmunjong, uh, the, the uh, demilitarized zone. And uh, this is kind of interesting here because as you're standing in that little hut in there, it's about the size of this room. There's a yellow line drawn right across it. So we're all walking across, and nobody warned us that you can't walk across that line. As soon as you do, this guy from North Korea bangs on the window. And it looks like he does that quite a bit because he had a big old sore on his hand. <laughs> so I think they get a lot of tours there on his watch, but uh, it's kind of comical. And of course, one of our privileges back home was that you got to go to the Kennedy Center whenever uh, the president wasn't using the presidential box. You could put your name on a little rotation list. So a lot of neat little privileges um, that, are, that come along with the duties, but a lot of responsibility as well. 
And um, so here's how our office was um, broken up. I don't mean to stand right in somebody's way here. But here's how our office was um, broken out in an organization chart. We had personnel security, industrial security, information security, and uh, the aspects of the counterintelligence and technical security. So I wore a couple of these hats right here uh, in that piece of it. So we would always send somebody on a, on a trip and um, um, work with Secret Service and work in that threat development and, and work the host nation uh, threat. But we'd also travel quite a bit inside the continental United States whenever there's a lot of foreign presence for the Olympics and things like that where you had a lot of foreign nationals that were gonna be involved in the trip. So this was our true mission statement as it was back in uh, 2004 when I left. And up front, just to let you know, I'm not giving you any kind of super, super, uh, you know, secret stuff that's not already out there. Well, maybe a little bit. I got a couple pictures. Maybe we'll turn the camera off, block it out just for a second. So that was our mission statement there. It's really force protection and uh, security of the, uh, the traveling staff and the, the senior staff in the, in, a, in the presidency. It was really not a Democratic or Republican position. It was apolitical, and you're really working for the office as opposed to the person. So when administrations changed, uh, uh, employees in the Secret Service and the uh, White House military office didn't necessarily change unless they were the directors uh, in those respective uh, organizations. So a lot of people have the misperception that when you work at the White House, this is what everybody's office looks like, and it's not. You know, hey, you got to go in there every now and again when they were out of town, and you can go in there and sneak pictures like this. But this is really what my office looked like. So it was pretty sexy, you know. And if you knocked on that, that was good old hard, hard steel uh, desk in there. And uh, not, a lot of, uh, not, not a lot of decoration there. I'd sneak my little UT Vols uh, stickers on there. But uh, anyway, so it wasn't as sexy as you might think. We did have some uh, pretty nice uh, communications gear. We had White House Communications Agency for all of our infrastructure and technology um, assets out there. So we had 19 simultaneous trip sites that we would support on any given day uh, around the world and, and inside the continental United States. Those guys in White House Communications Agency, I don't know if you've ever met any of those guys, they do a lot of, of really uh, great work with a lot of legacy technology. We've never experienced any kind of le legacy technology in our world, uh, I'm sure, in the, in the uh, IT world. But we used to have a saying, we'd say, you know, Waka, yesterday's technology, tomorrow. And uh, it, was, it was the kind of thing because they were using a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of analog devices to be able to support uh, the President of the United States. And you'd scratch your head when you'd see it the first time. You'd see a lot of these uh, road boxes there, and you'd pop that open. And, uh, you know, you, there's servers in there, and that ends up being a comm center inside that little box. And you're going, wow. And then you open up another box, and you see breadboards, and they're, they're punching down, you know, telco blocks in there. Uh, running room, uh, tell code of room. You're saying, oh, you gotta be kidding me, we gotta be digitized. Well, in some instances, you are. We used, uh, we call it counterintelligence human automated tool sets for, uh, for our services, and, and it really, it was just nothing more than, well, I'd hold up my little laptop right here, and it was really about as powerful as my laptop was. You had a regular old uh, laptop in there with some, some uh, secure devices on it, but it had a big old battery that would, would sustain you for about you know, half the time that my iPad or my Mac does now. And uh, you had to always co constantly plug them in. Uh, but we did have some communications where we could use an MR sat and, and talk from wherever we were and Iridium phones, and I'll talk to you a little bit um, how valuable Iridium phones were uh, on that day. So here you go. Here's one of those secrets I'm gonna I'm gonna divulge to you. A lot of people want to know what's going on underneath the White House. They hear about all these shelters and everything like that. So all right, you can cover it up or you can not cover it up. We'll go public with it. All right, no, I'm just kidding. We'll go public. All right, there you go. So there's a bunch of uh, it's just a public room there. It's all the rooms that you go on the public tours in the White House. I'm not really gonna give you many secrets except for this one right here inside the Secret Service, the Joint Operations Center in there, where they're monitoring all the assets. So anybody have any kind of uh, IT? rooms and you run any kind of knocks or socks in your in your spaces out there what's one of the big no-nos inside of your computer rooms well number one he gets the there you go it's like air okay yeah you know, they don't have they don't have starbucks cups over there but they got little white house logos on them they got white house m m's water yeah i think they are they probably are it says it says potus is the and, and that's the password is flotus um, and then uh, this one way over here on the right, you see that? That's a big no-no. A stapler on the, uh, yeah. No, I'm sorry, there's a nine mil sitting over there. <laughs> yeah, I just, <laughs> yeah, we don't allow staplers in there, damn it. <laughs> yeah, no, it, 
it, it's just a little bit of comedy there, if you knew my sense of humor. Um, so one of the indicators for whenever the president's inside residence, you'd always know that there's a, mil a Marine security guard standing out there in front of uh, the West Wing. And those guys are really sharp, and uh, they're, they're all uh, well beyond any kind of uh, regulations of fit. They had to have about a waist that's about that big around, and they had to just look super strat in their uniform, just like the guys who were guarding the uh, Tomb of the Unknown. Um, they're the best of the best, and those guys are really on top of it. And, uh, and that was just one of the ways that you could tell that uh, the president uh, was in, in residence. And um, there's snipers all around there all the time, somewhere. But, you know, they're probably a little more vigilant when, when POTUS is in town. So the rest of the time they're playing cards up there doing crossword puzzles. <laughs> Oh, continental United States. Uh, sorry, and Oconus outside the continental United States. Sorry, I should explain each one of them. I, I try to make my slides abbreviated so I don't leave a lot of text on there, but I should uh, uh, spell it out and I'll do that for the next one. So this is the time, like I said, that I was there from 98 to uh, 2004 through the first half, of, or the last half of Clinton and the first half of Bush. And so there was, there was the people in charge on the paper, but really the people who were in charge Everything kind of revolved around the pets in the White House, and it seemed like they get a lot more publicity uh, than everybody else. And I put the dogs in there because um, Barney and Spotty get a little, little bit of uh, press on 9-11. On, uh, so as I explained in the front of my talk was that my role uh, on 9-11 uh, was a little bit different than it probably had been in any other uh, day in that, that uh, uh, administration. Um, I don't generally support, or I didn't generally support, the first lady was always uh, really in a, in a presidential role or a vice presidential role where they're, wherever they were going to travel. But everybody just stepped up and you did something that was out of your box uh, that day. If you were asked, you didn't say no. It just wasn't, wasn't part of the equation. But uh, I, I learned a lot about her that day and, and learned to respect her a lot more than uh, I had ever imagined that I could uh, for a first lady. Uh, and I'll share a little bit about that. So we're all very familiar with what took place that day and the events around it. And just to kind of refresh your memory, um, that, that um, the events were really circling around four flights. Uh, the American Airlines Flight 11, 175 uh, for United, and then uh, one se or 77 and Flight 93. And 93 is the uh, um, last flight to take off that morning. So, I'm going to kind of run down the timeline and talk about president and vice president's roles and the first lady's role, and, and then kind of my, my actions are in red captured down here. So I won't bore you too much with a lot of text. But so, as was the case in most, case, in, in most days, the president was down in, uh, on a trip, and he happened to be in Sarasota, Florida, getting ready to speak with uh, uh, a class, an elementary school class. He was going to read some books with them and uh, spend some time in, in that kind of a, a less diplomatic uh, role that day ended up being one of the most diplomatic roles that he had to encounter uh, in, his, in his administration. But while he was going out for a nice leisurely run, the rest of us who were working there, we were finishing up our two hour commutes um, in the Beltway. My, I lived up in Frederick, Maryland, up north of Frederick, Maryland. So my commute was two hours each day, uh, each way. So you spent four hours on a good day without any kind of traffic accidents uh, if you were in town and not traveling. So I got to look at a whole bunch of red lights on my way to work. So. Um, at about 8.45 is when Flight 11 struck, uh, uh, struck the North Tower. And um, you know, everybody was speculating, well, maybe it was some crazy pilot who fell asleep or something like that. They didn't have it on autopilot, so really nobody was really up in arms uh, uh, on the public sector yet. I was on the phone with a guy named Brad, Brad Weber, who was head of our, our technical surveillance, uh, the guys who would sweep rooms for listening devices and emplace them if you were in offensive capacity. But in our role, we were always defensive. And, and protective. And so Brad and I were talking about an upcoming trip, and then he said, wow, you watched that on CNN? And uh, I didn't have TV on, so I clicked it on real quick, and we we're watching this, and all of a sudden everybody's going live. And, um, and then um, uh, the next thing, or I'm sorry, Mrs. Bush, in the meantime, she was en route to the Capitol, and she was to speak um, to the House that morning, and uh, she was going to have a meeting with uh, Senator Kennedy uh, ahead of time and talked about uh, they were going to get their story together and probably put together their little uh, presentation before they, they briefed uh, the House. And uh, she was briefed ahead of time that the first plane had hit, and as, as she arrived, um, the second plane 
and it struck uh, the south tower up there. All bets were off. Everybody knew what was going on. It was a, it was a very uh, targeted attack, and uh, things started rolling into gear. We have very uh, directed action plans and prepared action plans uh, in any kind of hostile event. So chaos was going on in the hallways, and I heard a lot of commotion outside of my office suite out there. And so I walked out there, and I ran into this guy. It was Anthony Scafidi, and he was uh, one of the uh, directors of the colonel in the Air Force for our, what we called it, uh, PPR, plans, um, programs, plans, and requirements. And they really worked a lot of these kind of emergency action um, uh, events is what they were always planning for. He, he looked over me, he says, Chief, he says, you need to go in there and call uh, the NMCC, National Military Command Center. <laughs> and um, um, in the meantime, he's saying, he says, you need to call NMCC and get an air cap over there. I never had any kind of plans to get an air cap. And I said, no, I'm not really sure what that's going to involve. I knew that any time we called somebody like that, we were going to have to authenticate. And I was pulling out my authentication card. Uh, anyway, at the, at the same time that that was going on, um, it, that's when uh, Andy, Secretary Card, who was the chief of staff of the president, interrupted his meeting with the kids and uh, whispered over his shoulder that if the second plane hit attack, we're under attack. Or he said, he's, the United States is under attack. And that's when, if you ever watch any of the video footage, President Bush, all of a sudden, his, his whole demeanor changed. His face got very serious. He didn't want to jump up and, and execute uh, his mission. He wanted to make sure that he was being, you know, exuding a, a calm posture for the children and uh, let them know that he's in charge and, and, and uh, you know, that he knew that they were going to find out about it later on. More importantly, anytime the president's in a room and if he were talking to a group like this, even if it were a small group, right behind everybody would be the reporters. And uh, so you have a whole crew of reporters back there and they're all up on podiums and all of a sudden, he sees their phones and, and uh, pagers buzzing and going off. So he, they're getting the same information that he just received uh, moments ago. So now he knew that he was on public stage. And uh, all the cameras were oriented on him. And he needed to exude that presence of leadership instead of you know, wigging out like I would have done. <laughs> so, um, so I called the military command center for air cap. Just a couple of fighters over, over the White House. That's all. And uh, so I called him up, and I told the guy exactly what was going on, and they already knew. And it says, requesting air cap, we need whatever you guys are going to provide over the White House. We needed surveillance over the White House for security. He said, roger that, got it, click. I got my card ready to go, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to authenticate, and there's a whole process for that. And, and I was kind of blindsided, and like three minutes later, there are two fighters flying around the White House up there. I'm going, wow, I did that. And I was thinking, now, I'm an insider's kind of threat guy. I'm a security guy, and I'm thinking, Man, I got this. <laughs> but that, that's something that came out let, um, uh, months later as we, as we kind of ran down the whole lessons learned of what could we have done better, what could anybody have done uh, better, what did we do right, what did we do wrong. And, yes, sir? They were armed. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And they were followed up with armed as soon as they were able to get it. I mean, it's really a lot of it is show of force uh, type of, and, and it was. It was, they were en route and, and turned, hey, bank left. Why? Just shut up and turn left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, all right, let's continue on the timeline. About 9, 9.18 is when, um, after that directed attack, that second directed attack, it was like, all right, let's start evacuating. So they started evacuating the Capitol and the White House at that time, because there were reports that were all flying around saying the White House is uh, uh, imminent threat, under imminent threat, the Capitol, any kind of uh, national archive in, in the uh, uh, Washington, D.C. area um, was under attack. And we had also heard that um, uh, DIA over Bowling Air Force Base had been attacked as well. So there was lot, lots of chatter coming on on the radios at that time. And um, so as we started evacuating our staff out of, the, out of uh, uh, the East Wing and the new executive office building and the old executive office building out there as well, uh, I happened to have 10 Iridium phones because we would take them with us on travel because some of these places we traveled to, we didn't necessarily have any kind of secure comms. So everybody's familiar with what Iridium phone is. It's just a satellite phone. It has a little secure card in here, and we have our own operator that we go through, and then we can patch secure calls through it. Well, during that, that time, 
the whole cell networks becomes, uh, had become saturated, so you couldn't pick up a phone and call anybody and let anybody know that you were okay at that time. Now, there were phone boxes around, and you had, you know, believe it or not, you had some, some regular old phone systems out there, and, and uh, um, AT&T and Ma Bell, whoever it was out there at the time, you could, you could get in and throw a quarter uh, in the phone. But if you had a cell phone, you weren't going to uh, get through to anybody. These right here were working great. We were rock stars. Secret Service was grabbing them from us. Hey, we need to borrow one of your phones. So I distributed them out to my guys, and uh, we were able to communicate back with the PIOC, the Presidential Emergency Operations Center, which is downstairs uh, in the basement of the White House. Uh, it's where our guys were kind of running command and control down there. Um, about that time, President Bush was preparing to uh, address the nation from the elementary school, and uh, everybody really expected that he was going to... Uh, uh, or the kids, I'm sure, were the ones who were expecting that he was going to, you know, do, the, do this little closing speech and, and thank all of them for uh, having him out there that day. Then he dropped the bomb uh, on, the, uh, on the nation. And the kids all had that look of surprise uh, in their face because they had no idea really what was going on. They were, they were pretty sheltered from but the public knew what was going on. So I had gone out uh, outside of the, the grounds now, outside of the 18 acres, and we began building, uh, pushing out everybody and evacuating all the buildings around the White House and around the, uh, the, the 18 acres, as we called it, outside the security perimeter, and was pushing them out as far as we could. Everybody was coming out of the buildings and um, all the way out to 19th Street, which is out there by World Bank. And uh, so the businesses were just leaving their doors open and they were running out and there was security out in the streets. But very quickly, the streets started becoming little ghost towns out there um, as, as the envelope began pushing out further and further. And um, Secret Service went and grabbed uh, uh, Vice President Cheney out of, uh, out of the West Wing and evacuated him, the National Security Advisor, and some of the other key staff downstairs into the Presidential Emergency Operations Center. And um, uh, this is my boss right here, Jeff Thompson. He'll come into play in just a little bit. So as we're standing out there, we're on 19th Street. Um, you know, there's a lot of speculation that there was never a plane that hit the Pentagon out there. And you can you listen to the conspiracy theorists, uh, conspiracy theorists who say that there was never a plane. I'll tell you what, I watched that, that plane fly at rocket speed right at treetop, or building top level, and I thought it was going to the World Bank, is where I thought it was hitting. But you could hear it just screaming, and I thought it was a fighter jet, and you looked out there, and it was this big monster jet coming down there, and then it went out of sight, and then a few seconds later, you heard it impact. Uh, over in the Pentagon. And then, of course, more speculation was coming out that other sites were being hit around, uh, around D.C., which were all false. So, right after the impact, I was called back into the PIOC, and they said, all right, we need you to link up with the First Lady. She's going into to a safe house. And um, I, I said, well, you know, how am I going to get around there? All the streets are blocked off, and I, I can't just go you know, be bopping up, you know, running down the street. So they got me in a Secret Service vehicle, and it was, it was almost uh, surreal because the streets were all, uh, were a complete ghost town at that time, and we were ripping up Pennsylvania Avenue and, and heading up towards the Capitol to go link up with her, and we were probably going 120 miles an hour. And I was thinking, man, if I can only do this, you know, without getting, <laughs> you know, but you, know, you can't go anywhere in D.C. If you've ever been down, who's driven downtown D.C. or tried to drive downtown D.C., right? It's always, you know, you go about from here to that, that uh, projector, and that's about as far as you can go at any given time. So it was really just one of those moments you say, wow, this will never happen again. Um, so um, Vice President at that time was down there, and one of the, the call-outs came from the air cap that was um, uh, following and chasing the, the plane that was going out to Shanksville, uh, Pennsylvania. They said, hey, we've got an unidentified aircraft. They're not responsive, and they're heading towards the White House. And, and, and it's an imminent threat. They're coming to Washington, D.C., and they're going to hit the White House. And the, the request was, can we engage this commercial aircraft? And uh, so Jeff Thompson right here in that picture, my boss, is asked President, Vice President Cheney, he engaged the president, and they, the answer was weapons free. And, uh, well, I'm kind of getting emotional on that because that's one of those things that you're, you're getting ready to take out um, civilians' lives. And that's kind of an emotional thing just to even kind of run through your head, um, the, the moral and ethics. Um, thing. And the pilots really had a hard time as they'll, as they'll relay later on in their life. Uh, that, that was a really tough decision for them to actually get that uh, response. Wow, I, I didn't realize I'd... Um, so I link up with um, probably the strongest person that day um, and uh, link up with the, with the First Lady. 
and she's already down in, in uh, the, uh, the safe house at the time, and she's, she's in a little conference room. It's about this size, and she's got TV and some drinks and everything set up in there, and a non-alcoholic drink. She's, she's drinking water, uh, but she's uh, uh, being taken care of, and we've got Ron Sprinkle and Nick Trotta uh, from Secret Service and Dr. Bill Lang, who's the, white, the, the deputy director of the White House uh, Medical Unit at the time, are down there. And um, um, right about that time, um, is when the, uh, the South Tower um, uh, collapsed. And it had only been 56 minutes since the impact on that one. And, um, and so that was a really emotional time. And then all of a sudden, you know, these, these evacuation plans uh, start accelerating. And, um, and, and that's when Flight 93 crashed in before anybody could execute on the weapons-free um, order that was given. So that time, First Lady pulls me aside and she asks, uh, asks me and Nick Trotta. Uh, Nick was um, head of her protective detail at the time and, and said, Here, here's what I want. I want some Blackhawks and I want to fly to my next evacuation point and here's all the staff. And she gives me a piece of paper, a yellow piece of paper. Here's all my staff that I want to bring with me. And one of those, one of those challenging questions, was, we'll, we'll work on it, ma'am, and we go over there and go talk to Nick and, uh, and Ron. And the, and the challenge was, there's a, a, there's a designated evacuation plan for the president and the vice president. Spouses are kind of ad hoc. We don't, you know. So the plan for the vice president, as you, as, you know, it's open source now. The vice president's plan was that he was going to drive in a motorcade to an offsite. All aircraft now, as you remember, were grounded, and uh, we weren't flying any kind of helicopters around, which are slow movers versus uh, fixed wing. And um, so vice president was even going to roll out in the motorcade. So if you think the vice president was rolling, do you think she was going to get six Blackhawks to fly? Um, so I got the, the nice honor of going in and telling her that she wasn't getting aircraft. And then I blocked my neck as she tried punching me in it. Uh, no, but uh, I mean, it was understood. And she said, OK, well, what, what's the plan? And uh, so we went, we went through the plan. And the plan was going to be, if we had to evacuate, it was going to motorcade. And, um, and shortly after that is when um, the North Tower collapsed. So. This is where it gets kind of good. I'm sorry, I'll be, I'm a little bit downer on this point, but it, there is a little bit of humor in uh, all kinds of tragedy. And um, so at that point, the president had already evacuated uh, Sarasota, and he, and he started uh, heading west, wanted to get him as far away from uh, Washington, D.C. as he could. He, of course, wanted to go straight to D.C. I need to get home. I need to show that I'm in charge, and I'm not going to be run off. Secret Service had other plans, and they trumped them for a little while and uh, was able to get him out of there. So he landed at Barksdale uh, Air Force Base. And um, um, First Lady uh, was told that, OK, we're going to start working an evacuation package for you. You need to get some things together and expect to be gone for uh, a few days. So she sent um, uh, Andy and uh, Andy Ball, which was her chief of staff, and uh, John Myers back there. And she said, oh, by the way, get the dogs and, and the kitty for me while you're there. The only two living members that were above White House grounds at that time, and they were in charge of the nation, were Spotty, Barney, and Kitty. And, uh, and so they, they grabbed them up in carriers and brought them back. And the first thing that she does is um, she starts putting them on a leash, and she starts coming out the door. As, as she finally got them, she walked out the door. I said, man, what are you doing? <laughs> she says, oh, I've got to go take the babies out to go walk. You can't go outside and go walk. You know, everybody's in a state of chaos, and, and they're going to see you. And they're going to know where you're at, number one. Call it a hiding, space for, a hiding place for nothing, for some reason, right? So I said, oh, I got it, I got it. So I took the dogs, and I walked around the corner. And just around the corner in the hallway, beautiful carpet. It probably cost more than my house. <laughs> <laughs> and it was thick. And I'm pretty sure it was, can we cover that camera? I'm probably but No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, it, it, was, it was nice. And it was Persian, probably. But, and it was really absorbent, too, by the way. <laughs> so, so walk around there and, and stand there with the dogs on a leash and said, come on, do your thing. And, and they did. They went piddle and walked around. And she said, did they go? And I said, mission accomplished. She said, oh, thank you. And I walked in. And I was like, you know, so everybody said, so what would you do on 9-11? I walked the dogs. <laughs> and then I turned to the uniform uh, Secret Service guy. And I said, we need to get somebody to clean it up because that's probably going to stain. I don't know. I, I'd love to see that dry cleaning bill. Um, but um, and that's, that's about that time is when um, President Bush addressed the nation from Barksdale. And it was a short speech just kind of letting uh, everybody know that we're going to um, uh, retaliate. And uh, we're, we're going to get him back. To, he says, I'm on my way back to, 
to Washington, D.C. Well, he wasn't. He was heading out to Offutt uh, at that time. Sir? Uh-huh. Well, yeah. Well, so you know, Air Force One is, or um, uh, Air Force One is uh, the call sign for whatever uh, fixed-wing aircraft the president's on. And so when they took off from Sarasota, nobody else was in the air at the time. So they only had all the air traffic controllers in the world. Only had one aircraft they were worried about. But they weren't calling themselves Air Force One. It was just you know, hey, what's what's the flight plan? And they're going, hey, he doesn't have a flight plan. We'll just do handoffs, you know, on, as, he, as he's rotating across the country. And, well, who are we handing off to? Well, you'll find out at the time. So it's just kind of, guys, just go with it. Um, so Mark Tillman, Colonel Mark Tillman was the uh, pilot at the time. And he was having a, you know, he was going as fast as that thing would go. If it, the wings would have bowed back, he would have probably gone supersonic on that thing. Um, so anyway, am I doing all right on time? Yeah, I'm doing good. So um, about that time, uh, First Lady was notified that uh, Barbara Olson uh, was on uh, Flight 77 that, that um, engaged the Pentagon. And, and she was a good friend of hers, worked for CNN and Fox. And uh, she, was the hus or the, she was the spouse of uh, um, Ted Olson, who was the Solicitor General for the um, office, uh, Department of Justice and good friends with them. And of course, that was an emotional moment right away when you, you, now you start having some personal ties with uh, some of the tragedy. Um, so this is another, another one of those comical moments uh, during the day. This is when I was called uh, darling by the President of the United States. Doesn't happen very often. Um, but uh, we have a protocol when we, when we engage a phone call, we would call up the, the White House Communications Agency operator and say, we're gonna initiate a call with the President on behalf of the First Lady. He's on Air Force One at the time. And, and so when they, they get him on the line, once they verify he's on the line, the next thing you hear is, is uh, the operator will say, Next voice you hear will be the President of the United States. And I'm supposed to say, next voice you hear is the First Lady of the United States. And we're supposed to kind of hand them off. I don't get that because it's all the excitement going on. And all I get is, hey, darling, how you doing? <laughs> the next President, the uh, next voice you're going to hear is the First Lady of the United States. And he goes, oh. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, I got called darling. And I walked dogs. You know, it was an easy day at work, right? <laughs> but uh, he didn't think that was real cute. Um, He's, he's, a, he's a river. He likes to kid around a lot. Worst thing you could ever do is you're, if he's ever given a talk is let your phone go off and uh, you'll get kicked out of the room real quick. You, your phone's buzzing? See you later. You get kicked out of the room by the president. You're probably not going to cover him anymore if you're a reporter. <laughs> um, but um, so this is about that time. He, uh, 250, he arrived in, in Offutt and, uh, and he was sitting, he, they took him down the bunker. They did some planning and they said, this is where you're going to stay for a little while. He says, I'm not going to be down here in a bunker in, in uh, off at North uh, Nebraska. So he said, we're going home. And uh, they made arrangements and got him home. So he returned to, to, to Washington, D.C. later on that evening. And, um, and shortly after that, we, uh, we connected up the First Lady and returned her back. And it was a nice little reunion down there in the basement real quick. And uh, he got to work right away with his uh, national security advisors and it began formulating a plan. One of the, uh, the things that came out earlier in the day was Vice President Cheney said, I want live footage of Ground Zero from overhead uh, satellites right now. I want, I want to be able to pull that in. And everybody just kind of looked at him dumped on us. We don't have that capability. What do you mean I don't have that capability? He said, I want to look at it and see what it looks like right now. Well, you can't just redirect a satellite. You have to catch them when they're in that swath. You can turn them on and and you can, you can tune them a little bit, but you just can't say, all right, we're gonna turn that sucker like on Star Trek and he's gonna come back around and, and, uh, and, and hit you. So right away, it was like, all right, you know, lessons learned, we need some more coverage. And then he wanted some footage, he wanted real-time footage of, uh, or not real-time, but near real-time, what it looked like just minutes before um, the incident out there. So he wanted rollover imaging. He says, well, how much do you want? All of New York, he says, I want the world. So we built the server of the world after that. Lots of money was available after 9-11 uh, that you didn't have uh, when Secretary Hammer was saying, hey, we're putting all the, the, the kibosh on a lot of your funding. 
but uh, I can tell you how much it costs and how, how, much, how many racks it takes to put the world in at, uh, at uh, five meter resolution, by the way. It was, back then it was five terabytes uh, for the world. But uh, I think it's a little bit bigger now. Now that you can get a lot of that stuff that used to be classified at imagery resolution, now you're down to, you know, five feet resolution is nothing. Now it's now it's inches that you can get in uh, public sector. Huh? Yeah. And so you know, Google for the four hundred dollar um, fee, you're getting uh, you know one foot resolution, and you can even go down some of these other services for inches. You know, is that quarter on heads or tails? Is that a D quarter or is it a <laughs> is that an S? So um, about that time, uh, 8.30, he addressed the nation, uh, as you know, from the, from the White House, and that was kind of his posturing that, okay, I'm back in the seat. You're not going to run me off, and here's what's going to happen next, and you're going to pay for it. So he had a long day. He and the first lady decided they're going to go upstairs to the residence and take a nap or go to sleep. And so they went down, and just after 10 o'clock is when they went to bed, and then uh, one of the F-16s that was uh, pulling air cap covered sport for the White House. Uh, when he was pulling air cap, he was go heading back to Andrews Air Force Base and had not checked in as he, as he crossed a, a sector out there. And all of a sudden, it sent up alarms. And they thought the White House was under attack. And they grabbed Secret Service, ran upstairs, shook the president awake, brought him downstairs. First ladies wearing very nice nightgown with a robe uh, over top with some fuzzy slippers. Presidents wearing some boxer shorts and this uh, probably more red like your necklace right there. Um, T-shirt that's got moth holes all beaten up and eaten up on there. I'm thinking, that's the President of the United States, and he's got a moth-eaten shirt. <laughs> awesome. You know, so when I've got a little hole in my shirt, my wife's ready to throw away. And I was like, well, POTUS can run around with it. So uh, that, was, <laughs> that was the last moment of, of, of comedy uh, that night. And then they realized, and they said, hey, it was one of ours, one of ours, and actually one of the uh, Air Force guys who was working uh, night watch in there said, Hey, sir, no, not, no sweat. It's one of ours. And he was like, great, I got out of bed for this. And uh, nobody really had a whole lot of sense of humor at, uh, at that point of the day. But all in all, it was one of those emotional days that um, everybody um, kind of stepped out of their comfort zone and stepped out of their box. And it, it was irrespective of what your role was uh, in an environment like that. Um, somebody asked you to do something, you did it. And uh, very commensurate to a lot of times when we run through emergency in our own environment out there. Um, when you're a team player, you just kind of do what you're supposed to do. But uh, with that, um, I know it's a little bit shorter than uh, uh, expected, but I'll offer it up and I, I welcome uh, questions about uh, anything on that day or outside the realm of 9-11. Uh, of Sir. So uh, watching her um, comfort us, um, here we were, uh, Ron Sprinkle, who was um, her deputy uh, Secret Service lead, and Nick Trotta was her, her lead, and um, Bill Lang. We were all uh, back in there trying to figure out how we were going to tell her that there wasn't a, a designated evacuation package uh, to, the certain, to the same extreme that she was expecting. And she saw us struggling with that, and we're all in there huddling up, going, "Ah, oh, dang!" You know, it's kind of like pulling straws. You know, you're gonna, you gonna tell, come on, you can, you know, it a little better than I do. And they knew her a lot better than me. Nick and and Ron were with her every day, so they could, you know, go up. I didn't see her every day, and uh, she finally came out and and just, you know, confronted us and said, "Look, just tell me the truth. You know, I can, I can take it. You know, this isn't kind of like, you know, this isn't my first rodeo." She didn't say the exact words. I was like, "Oh, whew. you know, she's just very approachable." And watching her, her demeanor all day long, with the exception of when um, um, Barbara Olson, uh, it was announced that she had uh, died in the, uh, or was on the plane that uh, hit the White House, or the Pentagon. Uh, she broke down then. But she was consoling. And uh, she, when she had called her uh, daughters earlier in the day um, and family, uh, she was you know, consoling everybody else. And, and she was you know, you know, a leader that day. Sir. I don't know that we'll, we'll ever know that. Uh, lots of speculation, but no, not, not that I know of. No, no, they were at school and they were taken to, to uh, safe houses. Uh, 
upon the second attack when they started evacuating all the senior staff and family members. Yeah. Yeah, and and so it was all over the map on you know National Archives. You know, hit the first, hit the first uh, uh, monument or first National Archive or f anything that really signifies uh, you know history in, in Washington D.C. and in America. You know, so, sir. Oh. Yeah, well, I learned how to build servers right away. That, that it was never in my realm. I mean, again, I was a computer crimes kind of guy, so I was always looking from uh, a different perspective. And the guys who were building in the defense, I was looking from the perspective of forensics, uh, CFE kind of background. And you know, all of a sudden, I'm thrown in because I happen to have a, a technology title in my name, and uh, uh, and, and because I'm in security, so well as a security. Uh, protective security measure we need to have the world at one meter well some places you didn't even have that resolution so there's a lot of there's a lot of disparate places out in the middle of nowhere that you don't have that um, but learned what it took and how how, how much uh, bandwidth it took for uh, for the world at the time but you know communications are key to anything I mean you can't accomplish any mission without communications and, and communications were down so there are a lot of um, uh, dark communications now uh, that we didn't have back then and um, there's a whole lot of people who, who are believers in iridium phones uh, that you know shortly after that they were investing in iridium phones if you were in the iridium business I think you probably saw a spike in your in your customer base yeah uh, and, and yeah so I mean you know for, for me a lot of it was plan 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 planning you know kind of run through the pardon my language the all shit scenarios think about the things that are bad if you run a data center think about all the things that could run and and uh you know cause mayhem how many how many data centers that have we read about in the last six months or year um that have been shut down by squirrels yeah, yeah hey, you know what vegas just got hit uh two days ago did you see the 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 flood that they have down there, they had a, an, a rain that hit like for four hours down in Las Vegas, um, out there towards the uh, University of uh, Nevada, Las Vegas. And they got slammed. It was on the news the night before I flew. There were people standing out in front of their homes and, and uh, emergency relief was out there and their houses were half underwater. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure they didn't have a flood plan out there. And so if you're in switch data centers down there in Las Vegas, I don't know how, how you know how they are in in that area i don't know where they are in relation to that that downtown las vegas area but you know they, they were probably one who who relooked their their flood plans that they probably don't have sir So in my role, my job was to go out and travel in advance about a month and a half in front of the president wherever he was going to travel to. If he was going to, you know, three stops in Europe, we would travel out there and work with host nation security, talk to those intelligence folks and work, you know, what are the local threats that you have? We'd bring that together and, and pull that and sync it up with our intelligence and put together a threat package. For, that's, for me, and working with uh, a Secret Service in a, you know, a true protective role, an evacuation rule, it was, it was out of my box. It wasn't something that, that I had to do um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So I was winging it right along with it. A lot of it was being responsive to the leadership and addressing those, those questions and demands in a lot of cases the best you can um, without, uh, you know, without losing any more that we already had. Yeah, true. You're, you're gonna wing it. You're gonna you're gonna have to have that uh, that fallback plan every time, and sometimes it's best to just go straight to your fallback plan. Thank you. 
And the worst thing anybody wants to hear when they call somebody for assistance is, it's not my job, right? You know, everything's your job when you're, I, I look at myself in a customer support role, right? I've got people in my data center relying on me to provide them space, power, and cooling and, and communication. Everything's my job if it means them getting a zero and one pass through. So. Sir. Wow, that's a pretty good smoke and mirror story. We'll stick to it. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, in all seriousness, no. There, are, there are very, very uh, uh, methodical plans. And uh, but yeah. Well. Yeah. So I think we're out of time, but uh, thanks for your, your time and attention and uh, appreciate you listening to me. Thanks. Thank